What's up guys, welcome back to Tech Tuesday. It's the show where we talk about tech. Sure. Now if there's one visual artist that pretty much everyone knows about these days, it's Banksy. Yeah. Which is ironic because pretty much nobody knows who Banksy actually is. Mm -hmm. now, since the early 2000s, Banksy has been making headlines around the world for his stencil art and it's heavy so that's not a Banksy, that's a Hanksy. No, I got a Banksy. It's a Hanksy, not a Banksy, it's a Hanksy. Anyway, he goes around the world, he puts up his stencil art, it's got social commentary and all that, and he's somehow remained anonymous despite having numerous art shows, art books, even a hit documentary called Exit Through the Gift Shop back mm -hmm. in 2010. Good movie. Yeah, but remaining truly anonymous in this day and age is nearly impossible. And despite Banksy's best efforts, some scientists at London's Queen Mary University may have just double confirmed his secret identity using a statistical technique known as geographic profiling, which is primarily used to track serious serial criminals as well as the spread of infectious diseases. In the article, Tagging Banksy, mm -hmm. Using Geographic Profiling to Investigate a Modern Art Mystery, published last week in the Journal of Spatial Science, researchers plotted the locations of dozens of Banksy artwork locations across London and Bristol and found that the hot spots on their map matched up very well with the known addresses current and previous of a man Well, named I don't see it! Robin Gunning. No! Ah, it, no, you spoiled it for everyone! Anyways, back in 2008, the Daily Mail outed Gunningham as the most likely identity of Banksy after what they said was a year of exhaustive research, uh, starting with an alleged photo of Banksy in Jamaica, leading to dozens of interviews across London and Bristol with people claiming to have met Banksy in his earlier street art days. And the eight years that have passed since that article was published, not a lot more has come out of the story. Uh, Banksy and his team, of course, deny that there's any validity to that Daily Mail hypothesis. But wouldn't you? Yeah. But, I mean, the idea that Robin Gunningham is Banksy has persisted. Yeah. It's, it's a Google trend. And then this latest attempt to connect the two identities actually faced opposition from Banksy's lawyers who delayed the article's publication after taking issue with how the study was being promoted in press releases. Yeah. He kind of looks like a, just a normal guy that comes and installs your cable. Not, hey. not a famous hey, street artist. Hey, it's Banksy. <laughs> it's Banksy. Hey, I'll get you a good deal on the cable. You slip me 20 bucks, get some My cable. favorite was the Onions uh, theory, or the Onions article. Like, Banksy I revealed, and it's just like this old lady. She's like, I just like putting the little paints <laughs> up on the walls. <laughs> yeah. Now, anyways, uh, whether it's just further proof that Gunningham, uh, that the theory of it being Gunningham is correct, that's still up for debate. But these scientists are putting their professional reputations on the line. And one of the authors of the article is Kim Rosmo, a former Vancouver detective who helped develop geographic profiling in the 90s and successfully used it to catch and convict a local serial killer. So he knows what he's doing with this kind of thing. Yeah, he pretty much invented it. Yeah. So at the end of the day, Banksy chooses to remain anonymous for a reason. Yeah. He wants his artwork to speak for itself and not have his personal life and identity tied into it. And in this day and age of everyone wanting desperately to be famous, that's actually pretty admirable. Mm -hmm. So whatever. Maybe Banksy is Robin Gunningham, but does it even matter? No. Just enjoy the pretty pictures or don't. Yeah, I think it, it, it. Even if he, this was true and it came out and it was confirmed, like, I at this point I don't think it would matter. Maybe it no. would matter 15 years ago, but at this point Banksy is bigger than any person. So yeah, I mean, all it and and all anyone's actually been able to come up with is like some very basic details on his life. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know. The worst that could happen is he gets arrested in every country in the world that he's vandalized. But I doubt anyone would actually do that at this point. He's like mm -hmm. a national. Yeah, Hero anything he paints there. on becomes instantly yeah. worth a million dollars, so there you go. Anyway, no. good job, scientists, you big killjoys. Yeah, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> Speaking of people who make tons of money by essentially breaking the law, it's been a while since we talked about daily fantasy sports on this show. And last we checked, things were not looking very good for DraftKings and FanDuel, who were starting to feel the wrath of various states' gambling laws after a couple years of insane profits and nonstop ads. Really, those ads were... I mean, Please come we, back. We had them. Please come back. They were lucrative. Yeah. Uh, the question has always been whether or not daily fantasy sports falls under the traditional legal definition of gambling. And the problem with that is that laws are always catching up with new technology. And, uh, I mean, we've seen it with ride sharing. We're seeing it here with daily fantasy sports. Yeah. But now the state of Virginia is leading the way with setting up rules for daily fantasy sports so that everything is done by the book on top of the table and everyone's getting their pockets filled. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe just signed the Fantasy Sports Act, which charges companies like DraftKings and FanDuel a $50,000 registration fee. Peanuts. And imposes age restrictions of 18 years old, just like regular old gambling. And employees of daily fantasy companies and those employees' relatives are officially banned from playing any daily fantasy sports contest. 
which is in direct response to the fiasco last year that made lawmakers concerned about this type of thing. It was basically, they were using their data to go bet on the other companies. Yeah, and it was things. a rampant yeah. problem. It's like, why did you, you were getting away with this for so long and then you go and do some bullshit like this, come no. on. Speaking of old institutions catching up with the internet, the Television Academy, which is the organization behind the annual Emmy Awards, announced last week that they're expanding their categories for short form content in a move that opens the door for a lot more internet native video content at the Emmys. Please vote for us. In a press release, Television Academy Chairman and CEO Bruce Rosenblum said, our industry is aggressively, quickly, and creatively evolving the various ways episodic stories are told. Our board of governors felt that this expansion of short form categories begins the process of ensuring that Emmy worthy creativity will be rewarded irrespective of format or platform. Mm -hmm. These category changes reflect the broader opportunities that emerging networks and distribution platforms such as Maker Studios, Full Screen, Awesomeness TV, YouTube Red, Adult Swim, and others like Machinima ETC, yeah. are seizing in choosing innovative formats that enable our television community to share stories in novel and entertaining ways. Hey, uh, Rosenblum's kids, if you're watching this, tell your dad to vote for us. Yeah. Uh, three new categories for series are Outstanding Short Form Series, Comedy or Drama, Outstanding Short Form Series, Variety, and Outstanding Short Form Series, Reality slash Nonfiction. To qualify, shows must have a minimum of six episodes with an average episode runtime of 15 minutes or less, and shows can be broadcast via broadcast, cable, satellite, or internet. They've also added two new categories for performers, Outstanding Actor and Actress in a Short Form Series, Comedy or Drama. Uh, this is great news for internet content, and it coincides perfectly with the launch of YouTube Red's original programming. Mm -hmm. It also paves the way for something we would have never thought possible just a year ago. Yeah. PewDiePie winning an Emmy! He's gonna get that EGOT before we're all yeah. dead. He's, I can't wait for his musical. Yeah, Scare PewDiePie could very easily win the Emmy for Outstanding Short Form Series Reality Nonfiction. Well, let's see, what else happened in tech this week? Yeah. Oh, well, astronaut Scott Kelly returned to Earth after spending a year on the International Space Station, longer than anyone else ever. Mm -hmm. Uh, NASA will now be studying his body to see what living in zero gravity for that long will do to it. And because Scott Kelly has an identical twin brother, who's also a former astronaut, they've got a pretty useful control group yeah. there. Uh, but so far, all they're saying is that he gained two inches in height. Whoa! <laughs> because uh, he doesn't have gravity, like, pushing down him. Oh, that's cool. He's taller, but he's also, like, way weaker. He can't he oh, barely yeah, walk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they do, work, they do work out up there, but it, it's not the same. Yeah, they have this crazy um, How do they jerk squat off? press thing. Like uh, like the walls come together and like squeeze you between them. It's it's uh, it's pretty cool. I want to I want to know how they how he jerks off up there. I don't know, but he very, probably gets very everywhere. Very carefully. Also, Remember when Bruce uh, said that there was a fart tube that he had to fart in? Yeah, he's still full of shit. Yeah. Anyways, uh, moving on, the founder and former admin of 4chan, Chris Poole, aka Moot, aka Sean Poole's brother, finally found his next job after stepping away from 4chan last year. And it's working for Google, of all things. What? Yeah, his specific role hasn't been revealed yet, but uh, many are guessing that he'll be helping Google reboot Google Plus into something that people might actually use. Need it to bring in those rare Pepe's. It was a fine platform. It just never took off. Needed more Pepe's and more uh, green text stories. Yeah. It was one of the first social platforms to have native uh, GIF playback. Yeah. There you uh, go. It was a quality platform, it was just no one used it. Yes. And finally, uh, speaking of Google, they just opened up the Project Fi mobile carrier program to anyone in the US who wants it. And if you sign up now, you get a Nexus 5X for $150 off its list price, which makes it just $199. Mm -hmm. And unlike with all the big carriers who sell you phones for cheap, but then use that device price to lure you into a shitty contract that you can't get out of, Project Fi is month to month. So even if you do just a month of Project Fi for like the $30 that it costs, you still got one of the best phones in the market for a massive discount. I, I might actually do this. People that use Project Fi say it's really, really good. I just can't. I have well, you use too much data. Yeah, I have an unlimited plan. Well, that's the thing is it gives you an unlimited plan and uh, and it connects to Wi-Fi constantly, so that's what brings your total data usage down and why they give it to you for cheap. But I, I, I'm perfectly fine with mine, so I haven't tried it yet, but I've heard that it's fun, that it's great. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, as we've explained before, it's, yeah. it's not like a typical carrier. It doesn't have any of its own cell towers. It's actually switching between Sprint and T-Mobile towers as it needs, and it also yeah. connects to Google Wi-Fi hotspots that are all over the place in big cities like this. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't lock you in a data plan. You only pay for exactly how much data you used. Uh, which can get expensive. It's like ten dollars per gig once you get over like three gigs or yeah. something. So you use like fifty gigs a month or some shit on data. Yeah, it's true. Well, you don't. You never turn your Wi-Fi on. It's faster than a lot of places' Wi-Fi. It's true. My, my network. It's true. So 
There you go. Everyone needs to upgrade your routers now. Call, talking to you, businesses. Uh, it's not the perfect plan for everyone's needs, especially if you use a lot of data like me, but it's great to have some new competition in the market and that'll hopefully make some of the big carriers squirm. So yeah, that's always good. Competition's good. A lot of the- Get rid uh, of the lines. Like what they're doing here is similar to what a lot of other like smaller companies like Nextel and uh, mobile PCS. And yeah. a lot of, I've seen a lot of those companies now they've completely changed their advertising strategy to like appeal to young people yeah. because they're like, no contract, you know, we, you, we just use other people's towers, we don't have any upkeep costs. It's just so funny because those used to be just like, hey, drug dealers and old people. <laughs> yeah, and, you want to <laughs> pick up a new track phone down at yeah, the 7-Eleven. Yeah, but yeah, it seems like this is the direction that uh, cell service is going in this country and I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Contracts are dumb. Yeah. 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 Anyways, that's it for Tech Tuesday this week. Uh, check out some other content that we have over here. Please go ahead and watch our video where we uh, drove around in Aston Martins for the James Bond Spectre, because we had a lot of fun doing that, and we'd like mm -hmm. to do more stuff like that, so watch more that. More cars. And uh, we also have a brand new podcast where we talk about reboots in general, but more specifically, Ghostbusters, and whether it'll be awful or god awful. Will Bustin' make me feel good? Probably not. And then, uh, news dump, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do Bye. It. Bye.